All across this ancient world, there are things we can't explain. Feats of engineering we have yet to match from a forgotten period in history that even though it is forgotten, the remnants of this glorious period in history are dotted all over the place in huge numbers. Thousands and thousands of giant stone structures weighing hundreds of tons and thousands of tons in some cases, all carved out of a single piece of rock before being apparently transported and raised into place without any clue as to how it was done. Wait till you hear this. On the island of Malta, a structure exists that was constructed in a practice known as Cyclopean rigging. The hypogeum on Malta is enormous and consists of subterranean structures excavated 2,500 years before Christ. And according to UNESCO, the ancient architects and engineers used Cyclopean rigging to help lift huge blocks of coralline limestone to form a structure that was perhaps originally a sanctuary which later became a necropolis in prehistoric times. A program of monitoring and research launched in order to understand the microclimate of the hypogeum was followed by a project for the conservation of the property designed and implemented in the 1990s. And this meant that a massive project to acquire houses directly above the site was established and the houses dismantled. Such is the importance of this site with light levels within the property also strictly controlled with visitor numbers completely limited. And these measures have helped to maintain stable temperature and humidity levels, which continue to be monitored closely. The fact that the casing still hangs on the upper part of the middle pyramid on the plateau indicates that those who stripped the fine limestone casing off the pyramid started at the bottom and progressed to the top. It is not clear exactly when the stripping of the casing of the Great Pyramid reached the top, but in the process, the upper courses were completely removed. The stripping was probably because the casing was almost entirely composed of the finer limestone from across the Nile Valley at Tura. In contrast to the cruder limestone from nearby quarries at Giza, at which forms the bulk of the core stones. This demonstrates that even in these dynastic times, the dynastic rulers of Egypt could not replicate these things, couldn't transport from the same quarry because they lacked the know-how and resources, and generally, as we see in later construction efforts, they just didn't know how to do it, and neither do we in modern times. Like all hidden treasure stories, Kerala's Sri Pinamimman Swami Temple has been a fascination in India for many years, one shrouded in mystery and fear. Sri Padmanabhan Swami Temple is a Hindu temple dedicated to Lord Vishnu. The shrine is currently run by a trust headed by the royal family of Travancore. The temple and its assets belong to Lord Padmanabhan Swami and were for a long time controlled by a trust headed by the Travancore royal family. However, now the Supreme Court of India has removed the Travancore royal family from leading the management of the temple. The Supreme Court of India and its seven-member committee have already opened six of the seven secret vaults and have discovered at a depth of 20 feet underground around 100 billion in treasure including golden idols, golden elephants, and idols wearing 18-foot diamond necklaces as well as countless bags of gold coins from around the world and ceremonial costumes included 66 pound solid gold coconut shells studded with rubies and emeralds from all over the world. In an inventory list from August 2014, Vault A contained 2,000 pounds of gold coins dating to around 400 BC. Also found was a pure golden throne adorned with hundreds of diamonds and fully precious stones meant as a seat for the 18 foot long deity. In additional solid gold crowns have been found, all studded with diamonds and other precious stones. The valuables are believed to have been accumulated in the temple over several thousands of years, having been donated to the deity by various dynasties and kings. Chamber B has long been considered by astrologers of India as highly mysterious, sacred, and too dangerous to unveil it. The enormous steel door of Chamber B has two massive cobras on it and has no bolts, latches, or any other means of entry. 
Around 100 years ago, when the area was grappling with a serious famine, the temple authorities tried to open the chamber to use the treasures kept locked behind the doors, but when they heard the sound of gushing ocean waves from behind the door, they stepped back and gave up the idea. Since then, it is believed that the chamber is connected to the sea, and any attempt made with the modern technology to open the door will unleash catastrophes across the state and in Kerala. According to legend, this portal unlocks by itself by speaking a sacred chant. Could this in fact be a stargate to another realm? Would force entry unleash mayhem? One of the most mysterious places in all of India is that of the Elephanta. No one knows who created the enigmatic masterpiece found here, and despite massive destruction of artifacts during colonial rule, enough still exists here to suggest that it was achieved with higher understanding and technology that is long forgotten in this modern era. Wait, do you hear this? The Elephanta caves found on Elephanta Island are of such stunning proportions that you could consider them on par with the Kelasa caves and temples. Just like at Kelasa, these cave temples are dedicated to the Hindu god Shiva. Hewn out of solid rock, this is another example of an extreme masterpiece in India. The undertaking would have been enormous, but no record of who built this or when it was built exists anywhere. The Portuguese inhabited this place in the 17th century, but gave up control to the British in 1661. The island was ransacked by the English, and in 1864, they tried to move a gigantic ancient elephant who gave the island its name. It used to dominate the South Shore until they tried to ship it to England, but instead they broke it into pieces and just left it in ruins until it was reconstructed many years later. And this story is common on the island. The ancient history of the island is unknown in either Hindu or Buddhist records. Archaeological studies have uncovered many remains that suggest the small island had a rich culture past. The regional history is first recorded in the Gupta Empire era, but these do not explicitly mention these caves. This made the origins and the century in which Elephanta caves were built a subject of much debate and mystery. They have been variously dated, mostly between from late 5th to late 8th century, but this is based on the dating of other cave temples in this region. Colonial era historians suggest that the caves were built by the Rashtrakutas in the 7th century or after, a hypothesis primarily based on some similarities with the Elalora caves. This theory, however, has been discredited by later findings and is a prime example of false dating of ancient historical wonders of the world. Before Islam reached Afghanistan, Buddhism spread. This was in part because the religion was not location specific. Believers did not need to worship at a particular temple or at a particular site as part of their practice. Worship could take place anywhere and at any time. This freedom resulted in the emergence of Buddhist cave architecture throughout Asia and indeed, if you visit Afghanistan's Buddhist statues today, you will see nearly a thousand Buddhist caves carved along 1300 meters of cliff face and it is against this backdrop of carved caves that the two monumental Buddha images were carved. In March 2001, Taliban leader Mullah Omar ordered Taliban forces to demolish the Bamiyan Buddhas. The direction to destroy the Buddha image was motivated in part by the Taliban's extreme iconoclastic campaign, as well as their disgust for Western interest and funding that had gone to protecting the images while there was an intense and growing need for humanitarian aid in the region. The Taliban's claim that destroying the Buddha sculptures was an Islamic act is belied by the fact that Bamiyan had become predominantly Muslim by the 10th century and that the sculptures had up until 2001 remained intact. The destruction of the Buddhas was a huge loss for our understanding of human history. However, even in darkness, light has a way of emerging. Wait, do you hear this? As far as temples in India go, this is one of the standout examples of the visionary concept of a brilliant architectural artist who was inspired enough to dedicate a large portion of his life to such an undertaking. To the viewer today, this place is mesmerizing and each wall of art is screaming out a different story each time. 
Built within seven years, the construction achieved in this time frame involved moving and placing almost 50 tons of rock every day. The main Viamana Tower is soaring 216 feet high. It dominates the main quadrangle and sits above a 90-foot sided square. The tower is elaborately articulated with a raised structure and attached columns which are placed rhythmically covering every surface of the Via Mana. Everything about the temple is grand. The Colossa at the top of the Via Mana is a single rock that weighs 80 tons and a 20-ton monolithic Nandi. It was the first all-granite temple in India weighing a stunning 130,000 tons altogether. There is not a granite quarry within 100 miles of the site, so the undertaking would have been of Herculean proportions. It is not clear how this was done. The Borobudur Temple on the island of Java is the world's largest Buddhist monument. Said to have been built at least 1300 years ago, this religious structure with its wide base and tiered mound is another example of a pyramid. Consisting of six rectangular terraces topped by three concentric circular terraces, this intricate pyramid design has intrigued scholars, especially when viewed from the air. Borobudur is definitely not an obvious pyramid, but it is a pyramid, make no mistake. It is a step pyramid on top of which structures have been built. The Borobudur Temple is known as a shrine, but also a place of pilgrimage where people start at the base and work their way up to the top, which they theorize is like reaching Nirvana. Archaeologists believe it was chiseled out of the hillside starting at the top and ending at the bottom. If this is true, then just how was it done? It is absolutely mind-boggling and it is the single most magnificent piece of ancient majesty that points to the fact that an ancient civilization existed in the very remote past that were capable of just about anything surpassing modern day construction accuracy in a time that we are told we were not even conscious yet. Some historians estimate that construction of the temple required the removal of over 400,000 tons of rock. But even more incredible is that mainstream archaeologists propose that this feat was accomplished in just 18 years. Most researchers point out that 150 years to accomplish this task is more realistic if it was in fact achieved by human labor. The enormous complex carves into the side of a mountain with such intricate detail that simply blows the mind. How did the ancient people create this wonder? And what did they do with all of the excavated rock? Nobody knows, but the answer must lie in the loss of a technological understanding that has since been lost. Depicted for the Lord Shiva, the manifestation of the god in the sky going through some very discreet phases. And could this place be a shelter for the people during the cataclysmic occurrences? Does the depictions of Shiva show the squatter man event in every phase? And if so, are these explanations of what each phase meant to the people who created it? The Kailasa Temple is the 16th cave and is one of 32 cave temples and monasteries forming the wondrous Elora Caves. Nowhere does it say when it was built, but it has been assumed by historians to have been commissioned by Rastrakuta King Krishna the First. But that is based on two epigraphs that link the temple to Krishna Raja. The name Krishna Raja is one of the ancient Indian names and is derived from the Sanskrit roots Krishna and Raja. Krishna means lead and Raja means king. Together, they indicate king. Master craftsmen carved the gigantic structure from a single piece of solid rock thought to have been a cave on the mountainside. And this painstaking process removed more than a shocking 200,000 tons of volcanic rock, of which has never been traced in this region, leading to a widespread speculation on what tools were actually used when carving out this amount of rock, with some suggesting that this was carved from the top to the bottom by an advanced piece of equipment. Hindus created the temple to honour Lord Shiva, and they intended to mimic his home on Mount Kailash in the Himalayan mountains. And in this sense, they tried to create the cosmic mountain, or perhaps they tried to cast a spell to re-establish the break between the heaven and the earth after the cataclysmic occurrence. 
Some of these elaborate carvings show Shiva going through the phases, while other carvings show a great assembly of gods, with Shiva harmoniously flanked by two elephants, while his bottom half is obscured by the cosmic mountains. The temple is created as a U-shape and is about 150 feet deep. Kailasa Temple is three stories tall. Large stone carvings along the outer walls depict various Hindu deities, while two internal flagstaff pillars show stories from Lord Shiva's saga. And there are also enormous carvings honouring Lord Vishnu, possibly the main deity in the Squatterman event to the Hindus. And almost every inch of this interior structure contains an intricate carving.